If you have your Bibles with you, turn to Isaiah chapter 11. For those of you who might be visiting today, we have been studying the book of Isaiah for the last few months. And um, last time that I was in the pulpit, we studied the first section of a two-part sermon. The first part was chapter 9 uh, through chapter 10 through 15, where God is saying to his own people, my hand of wrath is still outstretched. And he repeats that phrase four times. The theme of these first couple chapters is that God loves his people very much, but God's people have relegated their worship of him to just Sunday morning, Sabbath morning, and therefore God says, I'm done with you because I want to be Lord of all of your life, not just on Sunday morning. And the wrath of God begins to get poured out on both the 10 northern tribes as well as the southern tribes of Judah. But we come to chapter 10 and verse 16, and then through chapter 11 through 16, that's what we'll deal with this morning, we see how the grace of God triumphs, even over our disobedience, even over our unwillingness to follow the Lord, the grace of God ultimately triumphs. So let me begin in the middle of our passage this morning with chapter 11. In verse 1, hear then the word of God. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, and from his roots a branch will bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions to the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. And the wolf will live with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the goat, and the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, the infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand in the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all of my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, in that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the people and the nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks for your word. And as we come to your word this morning, we pray that you would make our hearts leap for joy, for this is your word to us. As we come to know you and understand you, as we come to your word to know ourselves and what you require of us, help us, Father, in our understanding. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A.W. Tozier wrote this, quote, What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. The most important fact about any man is not what he at any given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be." End of quote. 
as we said the last time, the secret to who you really are and the key to your future is not your self-image. It's your view of who God is. It's your God image. The gospel saves us not by improving our self-image. The gospel saves us by improving our image of who God is. And it gets us thinking radically, as we saw last time, about the wrath of God, the holiness of God, but longing, longing for the mercy and the grace of God. And so in our passages this morning, Isaiah concludes about grace for Israel in spite of their failure. And he wants to give them a vision for the beautiful kingdom, the kingdom of God that Jesus will usher in, a kingdom that will heighten their view of who God is. It will heighten their view of what God is trying to do in history. It will heighten their view and our view of what God is calling us to do while we wait for his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. And when we see in this passage God bending his grace on our behalf, working in us in such a way to prepare a new heaven and new earth, it changes everything. I've been reading this book by the Japanese-American author Ujimura. And in his book, Art and Faith, he talks about this practice within Japanese art known as kin kintsugi. And it's, kintsugi is that form of art that takes broken porcelain. Maybe you have at home a, a little teacup or a little teapot that's made out of porcelain. You know what happens to it when you drop it. Kintsugi is the art of taking the broken pieces of pottery and mending them back together. And the art is a very refined piece of art because it takes lacquer and it takes pieces of gold. And the lacquer and the gold is woven into all the cracks as this piece of pottery is put back together. And the new piece of pottery that is made, this new piece of pottery that is created, is beautiful, but not because it's perfect. It's beautiful because something beautiful has been made from that which was broken. It has been redeemed. And there is beauty in that which was once broken but now remade, made anew, redeemed. That's what this section of Isaiah is about. Creating something new out of that which is broken. From Isaiah's perspective, The Lord finds our desires for the things of God to be weak. We are half-hearted creatures. We fool around only with what the world can offer us. The world offers us pleasure, it offers us power, it offers us various things that we can collect. When infinite meaning infinite joy, infinite fulfillment 
await us if we only begin to see what God is doing in history. We are like the small, ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies because he cannot imagine what it means to create and make things new in service for the king. You can put up the next. And the next. This past Tuesday, Caleb was with me. This is our grandson, Caleb. Caleb was with me um, before I took him back to Jamie's house. And over the years, uh, Caleb is, is 11 years old, but certainly for the last seven or eight years, Caleb has been making things with clay. And he was on the back porch, and he has a large container of all the different types of clay that he uses to make these creations, just with his fingers, not with any tools, just with his fingers. And I had just been reading Art and Faith, and I had been reading Isaiah chapter 11. And so I sat down with Caleb. You can go to the next picture and the next one. OK, you can keep it there. And I asked Caleb, as he's making, who is God? And Caleb didn't quite know what I was getting at, so we had to talk a little bit. And eventually, he came to the conclusion, God is the creator God. He is the maker of all things that are good. And I said, who are you? And again, we had to have a little discussion so he knew what I was getting at. But he came to realize he has been made in the image of God. And being made in the image of God means that he, in some small measure, is also creator, maker, small c small m. And so we talked about Isaiah chapter 11 and chapter 10 and how God redeems us so that we can work in the creation to take that which is broken, as the Japanese do with their broken porcelain, and make something new. And how God gives that to us in all areas of life in music, in art, in economics, in politics, in medicine, in plumbing, in electricians. God redeems us so that we, with our hands, can create things that give glory to God in all of life and don't just releg relegate our worship to God on Sunday morning. Isaiah's vision of God in chapter 11 and what God is doing in history and what he wants us to do with us can stimulate us in such a longing that we stop settling for making mud pies and setting our course for making all things new. To see our God as the king of grace and that while we live in this broken world filled with sin and evil, This low light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel? No. I'm going to let it shine. And I'm going to take my light and infiltrate every area of the created order so that I might work with my hands to bring glory to God in all things. Following the Lord with this kind of calling is daunting. But we become courageous. We become alive when we begin to see the mighty grace of God, the Lord of hosts, working in us and through us and beside us. And so what does Isaiah see? 
when he looks at what's happening historically to Israel at this particular moment in history, even though Israel has been wicked and the wrath of God has come against them, Isaiah says the grace of God is also working. And while the grace of God, the wrath of God destroyed much of Israel and of Judah, the grace of God works with the remnant. And so look at chapter 10, verse 19. We see four ways the grace of the Lord works as the Lord of hosts. Chapter 10, verse 19. The remnant of the trees of his forest, the Assyrian army, which God had used, will be so few that a child can write them down. This chapter, and chapter 10 and chapter 11, are filled with metaphors, and this is one of them. But God is going to cut down the armies of Assyria who have come against Israel. The grace of God is going to be used to come against the enemy of Israel and cut them down so that the armies of Assyria will be able to be numbered like counting on a children's hand. And this is why children of God never despair with what's happening in history, because we have no idea what God is doing behind the scenes. Whether the opposition to our joy is little thorny briars, verse 17 of chapter 7, or the vast forest, verse 18, makes no difference to the Lord, who is represented as fire in these verses. You know, when I listen to Christians today, I get, I get concerned because I see Christians looking at the landscape of what's happening in our own country, what's happening around the world, Christians listening to YouTube, and their hearts are being filled with fear. And I want to send them back to chapter 10. You have no idea what the Lord of hosts is doing in history. He hasn't revealed that to us. But he is at work. And so we don't and shouldn't be a people of despair. We need to be a people of hope. And so chapter 10 and chapter 11 is to give us a little glimpse of what God is doing in history. Secondly, the grace of the Lord of hosts purifies the remnant of Israel. Listen to verse 20 of chapter 10. In that day, the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob will no more lean on him who struck them, but will lean on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. When people are set apart by the grace of God, they demonstrate real faith. The question Isaiah wants each of us to be thinking through is, where do you get your security? Where do you get your confidence for the future? Do you get your confidence in a political party? Do you get your confidence in, in how large our armies are? Many salvations within our culture are vying for your allegiance. And every false support that we lean on turns around and ultimately bites us. The Lord wants you to know that you need to lean on him in truth and to lean on him alone because that is your ultimate salvation. And when he rips from your arms some false trust that has struck you a thousand times and a thousand times you have gone back to serve that false trust and you're ready to go back in servitude again to that false trust and God tears it away from you in his wrath? You understand that wrath is the grace of God and that his grace is setting you apart as part of the remnant. Another mark of the remnant people is repentance. Look at verse 21. A remnant will return in the remnant of Jacob to the mighty God. The mighty God is the same term used in 
chapter 9, verse 6. The title means that God is a God of military prowess, the God who can fight and win. And return is repentance language, coming back to God. And so coming back to God means that we repent of the way that we fight our battles. Bill Wickham has a song that's popular on the radio these days. Part of the lyric says, and so when we fight, we fight on our knees because the battle belongs to the Lord. And so I lay all of my fears at your feet because the battle belongs to the Lord. So the people of God are known by their courageous trust in him alone and a repentant willingness to allow him to be the hero, to allow him to be the king of kings. And thirdly, the grace of the Lord God of hosts makes fearful Zion. It makes fearful people of God confident once again. Look at verse 24. Therefore, says the Lord God of hosts, O my people who dwell in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrians when they strike you with the rod and lift up their staff against you as the Egyptians did. And then verse 26, and the Lord of hosts will wield against them a whip as when he struck Midian at the rock of Oreb and his staff will be over the sea and he will lift it up as he did in Egypt. God says, have confidence in me. I was with you when Gideon with his mere 300 men stood against the Midianites. And when the Egyptian armies were pursuing you and you had not a weapon in your hand, they were wiped out because of me. Be confident in who God is. Finally, the grace of our Lord of hosts brings the haughty, prideful Assyrians low. Look at the last line, Isaiah chapter 10, verse 33. And the lofty will be brought low. God stands again against worldly arrogance and arrogance in Christians as he did Israel and Judah. And the confident Assyrian army advances step by step. And God's people are running away. But at the last moment, God steps in and he cuts down even the pride of the Assyrians. Back in verse 15 of chapter 10, Assyria was the ax in God's hand coming against Israel. But now the Assyrians themselves are forced that's being felled by the ax, the Lord. God is not the police of world politics, but God hates evil, which is the root of all injustice. And God stands against evil in every culture and in every nation. So God has set in plan a plan of redemption, which begins with us. It began with the coming of Jesus. And Jesus says, the kingdom of God is in your midst. The kingdom of God has arrived. But one day the kingdom of God will be fully realized when God comes again and stands all over all the nations, and every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. But the kingdom of God has come. Jesus lives in our hearts, and he sends us out into the world. In chapter 11, we see the triumph of God's grace. This Structure of chapter 11 is very intrinsic, and I'm not going to get into all of the intrinsicness of chapter 11. 
But the central focus is clear. At the close of chapter 10, what do we see? The infestation of human pride, both in Israel, in Judah, and in Assyria, and the vast forest, the ax cuts it all down. God swings his ass, ax, and the whole evil system falls. Bare stumps as far as the eye can see. No branches swinging in the wind. No birds fluttering around in tree branches. No life, no movement, no sound. The world is dead, or so it appears. But when you come to chapter 11, joy springs to your heart because God has a plan. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. This is the holy seed that Isaiah spoke of back in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 13. This is the holy seed that Moses, when he wrote the book of Genesis, refers to in Genesis 3.15. The seed of the woman who will come and crush the head of the serpent. This is the promise made to David that your kingdom will have no end, that your kingdom will be eternal. And Jesus also has the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We see this referenced in chapter 61 as well. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And the spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and a spirit of might, and the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And when Jesus quotes from this passage in Isaiah 61, in Luke chapter 4, when he quotes from this passage, he says, today, this has been fulfilled in your presence. Jesus doesn't need our mechanisms of power. We have nothing to fear, and we are foolish to resist Jesus, and we can never be too loyal to Jesus. When our own leaders trumpet their ideals, we have to be cautious. But the Messiah deserves our enthusiasm. Verse 5, righteousness shall be the belt of his ways and faithfulness the belt of his loins. Jesus Christ is clothed not with the trappings of human ego, but with righteousness and faithfulness. We can trust in him and him alone and not have to be on guard as to what it, he is speaking is true or not. If we don't hold back, or if we do hold back, we're saying that we are more to be trusted than he is. We're saying that he is no better than pompous Assyria or the wishy-washy king Ahaz. That's our greatest sin, human pride. And God will come against human pride, as he did with Israel, as he did with Judah, as he did with Assyria. The one anointed with the Spirit is the only one able to come and establish the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. He made this world. He made you in his image to be makers and creators. And he's going to transform it, much like the Japanese artist transforms their broken porcelain. And as he redeems us, he sends us out into the world as a light unto the nations. And we're to take up our original task of redeeming, restoring, cultivating, making the creation in such a way that every aspect of creation gives glory to him. We don't experience his kingdom fully come, but we see hints of it. We see it when God's people 
are working to bring him glory. We see it in the Congo with Bill and Ann Clemmer. We see it here in our own community as those of you who have infiltrated the community and have begun to do works of light, of grace and mercy in the name of Jesus. And one day, Isaiah says, this is what's going to happen. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together. And a little child will lead them, and the cow and the bear shall graze, and their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play with the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the otter's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This passage is referenced again in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 7, verse 17, when Isaiah says of the Lord, I am creating a new heaven and a new earth. Isaiah is not telling us when all this is happening. That's not the purpose of this passage. He is telling us who. And that's the most important thing. It's the Lord. History is not unraveling. History is at the mercy of God. And God is directing history according to his will and his purpose. Knowing who directs history. Knowing us who is the Lord God Almighty ought to be enough for us. Verse 10, we read, In that day the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal, also being translated banner, for the peoples of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. When Francis Scott Key wrote what we call the American National Anthem, he was a prisoner. He was a prisoner on one of the British battleships in the War of 1812. And the enemy ship in which he was a prisoner was firing on Fort McHenry all during the night. And Francis Scott Key penned, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. That's the position of believers. We're prisoners on the warship. But the kingdom is established, and the flag of Jesus, the banner of Jesus, is covering us. And it will never fail. It's opposed But Jesus reigns. Our part is to stay true, even while the bombs are bursting in air. This is a prophetic word from Isaiah to us. One of my questions to you this morning is, has this prophetic view changed your view of who God is and what your calling is in all of life. Paul writes to the Ephesians, we are God's handiwork, created, made, new. Think of the porcelain, Japanese porcelain. Created and made new in Jesus Christ to do good work to go out and to do good work. Use your hands. Be in the image of God, which God prepared beforehand 
for us to do. Creating and making is hard work. Creating and making in a broken world is particularly hard. But God has called us to participate in something beautiful that will culminate in Jesus coming back to this earth and making all things new and establishing his rule over all of creation. But he gives you and I the privilege, the joy of participating in that in some small measure. We wait for the kingdom of God to come fully on earth. But while we do, we are the workmanship of Jesus Christ, set to do good works in the world so that we might establish something of his kingdom. In the meantime, I don't know about you, but I pray, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Because the making and the creating is hard. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks for your word. And we give you thanks for your word because it is your grace to us. We've, we've been sinners. We don't deserve this. And yet you've poured out your spirit so as we read these words, while they're sometimes difficult to understand, we catch a glimpse of who you are, who we are and what you are doing in history. And so for that, Father, we give you thanks. But Father, this is a broken world. And the art of making and creating is not easy. So strengthen the work of our hands. So that the work of our hands as we go out into the world might in some small way point people to Jesus. We ask for your help. In Jesus' name, amen.